Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good to see you today. That means you're healthy. Hopefully you're healthy. Uh, the, the fever virus thing that's going around, hopefully you avoid that. Uh, but we're not doing music this morning because we have um, a couple of things to get done and want to give the maximum time for that. Um, so we have a, a Jody Shumway, is that the way to pronounce it? Uh, from the Eden Project is going to talk to us a little bit. Um, we're going to watch a video, uh, give us a little bit more um, understanding of what they're doing. But the Eden Clinic is a Christ-centered, pro-life, nonprofit pregnancy care center in Norman. And then after chapel today, when you exit, you're going to be able to get a baby bottle. And so we're having a contest to fill it up with change. If you want to put bills in it, great. But... Um, to see which class can raise the most money to help the Eden Clinic out in Norman. And then the, the class who raises the most money will, on the next executive dress day, you're going to get a CHA tur shirt, turt day? Shirt day, whatever a turt day is. I don't know what a turt day is. Uh, we do know what a CHA shirt day is. Uh, so you'll get that the next executive. So you don't have to wear a tie. You don't have to wear dresses. Um, you can have a CHA shirt day. So, if we'll run the video, and then after that, Jody, you can come and speak to them. After the video, I'm not, I'll go ahead and introduce Chad Cargill. Um, okay, most of you know the Cargill families. A lot of you have done the ACT prep class, um, but he's going to come and speak to us today. And he's a longtime friend of mine. Um, he's a father of two graduates and several kids in school. Kai and Creed and Clarity, I think all in the junior high. So he's going to be our speaker today. So after uh, Jody is done, Chad, you have the stage. Okay, let me pray real quick and we'll get going. God, we do just pause and acknowledge that you are God. Um, Lord, I also acknowledge that um, in this room there's a lot of people who are um, hurting or struggling with a variety of things. And, um, Lord, that, uh, that's part of life. It's, no, it's the, the not fun part of life, um, but it is reality. And so I pray that you would minister to them today, that you would encourage them. I pray that people would um, encourage each other. We all need encouragement. Um, and so we just pray that you would work in and through uh, the things that are done and shared in chapel today uh, to uh, help us, to encourage us to learn more about who you are and your love for us. And we do pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you'll run that video, John. So this is the documented moment of conception. And the, the sperm enters the egg, and there's this poof of light that comes off of it. Scientists are studying this, and they're looking at it, and they're like, okay, well, it looks like it's a release of zinc, a burst of zinc that comes off the egg, and it creates this appearance. But any way you slice it, they can't explain away that light happens when life happens. Is that amazing? Light happens when life happens. In the beginning, God spoke, boom, life entered the earth, light happened. When God spoke you into being, light happened. Life came and light happened. Biblically, we equate light with life. Light and life go together. It is the nature of God, and so when we walk in light, we are walking in life. Good morning. Good morning. As he says, um, Mr. Bullard said, my name is Jody Shumway. I'm the director for Eden Clinic. Just a very brief description of what we do. We are a Christ-centered women's pregnancy center. We are in the mission. This is our 29th year of saving babies from abortion. That is our primary mission. In doing that, we also serve women who are uh, choosing to parent, so we have parenting classes. This last year we started dad classes. So we're walking alongside the moms and dads who are choosing life for their babies. So how do we do this? We do this in a very loving way, showing them grace because God has extended grace and forgiveness to all of us. Um, we know that, um, I'm just going to jump into the topic, so here we go. 
We know God has called us to sexual purity, but not everyone in our community knows Christ, and at Eden Clinic, we see the results of that lack of knowledge, and oftentimes we see the result of poor decisions. So I'm going to share a couple of scriptures with you that really touch me in this ministry. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 5, it is God's will that you be sanctified, that you, sh- I'm sorry, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your body in a way that is holy and honorable, not like those who do not know God. So as Christians, God has um, commanded us to be pure and to um, use our bodies for him. Unfortunately, at our clinic, we don't see a lot of young women or young men come in um, who know Christ. So part of our mission is sharing Christ with them as a Christian organization. Now, I say that, and you might be surprised, that many of our patients are Christians. Many of them are believers, and they've made bad decisions. But as I said first, God extends grace. God extends forgiveness. And oftentimes we see these Christian women come in who have made bad decisions. So that is when God is extending grace. So the other verse that I want to share is, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So this is where we come from as a Christian organization. We want to um, reaffirm God's love. We want to reaffirm his grace. We want to reaffirm the choices that people should be making um, in their lives. A lot of decisions, but this is the one that we, we work, work with daily. So on any given day, we can see one, two, three patients come in who are not saved. We can see two, three, four patients who are saved. Those discussions are very different because in some we are sharing the gospel with them, um, encouraging them in a walk with Christ. In other times we are encouraging them to come back to Christ to make a good decision. So what we have shown them is that God has a plan for their lives, a plan for their babies' lives, and a plan that honors and glorifies him. So we walk along beside them. Like I said, we have parenting classes. Very often in the pro-abortion world, you will hear on media that pro-life organizations are just what they call pro-birth. And then when the babies are born, we totally forget about the moms and all that. We do not do that. We walk alongside moms and dads through the baby's second birthday with parenting classes material goods, um, anything that they might need. So we're, we like to say that we are pro-woman, and in that we are pro-life and pro-baby. So um, let me see if I can find my notes. So as they are making a choice for life, which does honor God, even though their original choice may not have honored God, they're making a choice for life, Because abortion and death never honors God. That is never an honorable choice. So today, as Mr. Bullard had said, we've brought baby bottles. As an organization, we are funded 100% by donations. Um, We don't, I mean, our grants are about this big, and then donations are 99.9%. And when you are partnering with us in the Baby Bottle Project, What you're doing is you are showing these moms and the dads that you love them, that God loves them, and that we're going to, as a team, as partnership, we're going to walk alongside them, at least for the next two years. And it's not unusual for them to call us two and three years down the road and go, hey, I have a question. So, and our our team is very much open to those phone calls. So... 
I just want to encourage you in what you know, what we've talked about, the, what the scripture says about your bodies, um, using your bodies as a servant for, for God. Um, and we want to encourage these young women as they are choosing life for their babies. And through your baby bottle project, I didn't know it was going to be a contest. That's awesome. So through your, through your donations, through your gifts, and through your partnership, you are also partnering with these moms, letting them know that Christ loves them. And if you have any questions, pass them along to your instructors, Mr. Bullard, um, Ms. Sherry, I can't remember your last name, Sherry. And they will get those to us and we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have about our ministry. Okay. Hey, good morning, CHA. Thanks for letting me be here. Um, I got to tell you up front that uh, I graduated Hera, and I'm, I got to be fully transparent. I hated CHA. I hated him with a passion. And uh, I played four sports at Hera, football, baseball, uh, basketball, and tennis, and we played CHA every year, and I, I hated CHA. And uh, I, I told this to our junior high track team last year at the first meet, you don't realize how... You're, the way you interact with other players and other teams impacts people. And it really does. It can impact them in a good way and a bad way. And uh, when I was in high school, I've never been cussed more by, a CHA, by anyone in sports than I was CH athletes. And uh, treated so badly. And I hate them. My friends still can't believe I put my kids in CHA. And you go, well, why are you telling us this? Well, I, I think I'd do a disservice to the school if I didn't mention Mr. Holmes in this. It's about 1995, I was invited to come to CHA to teach my ACT class by Mr. Holmes. Now, I was, I was young then. I mean, he took a chance on having me come here, and I hated CHA. And he brought me here, and there was something different. I didn't know what it was, but there was something different. I saw something different in the kids. I saw something different in Mr. Holmes. Talked to Mr. Holmes a bunch about this. And over the years, he had me come every year, and I kept talking to Mr. Holmes about it. And uh, I just told him, I said, Mr. Holmes, I had such a bad view of Christian education and Christian schools. And I told him why and all that. And, you know, he just kept, in, you know, he, he never told me, hey, you should put your kids in CHA, nothing like that. But he just kept encouraging me, and I kept seeing something different. I remember finally we decided maybe we should consider CHA. And I remember I, I even wrote a couple students who had been in my workshop. And I remember uh, Katie Fountain was one of them. I remember she wrote me back this great letter about how the impact CHA had had on her life, how it had changed her life. And how, Chad, you've got to consider getting your kids a CHA because I think it'll be the greatest investment you ever made. And I'm just telling you, it is the greatest investment my family's ever made. We cannot believe the quality of education at CHA. We can't believe the staff here, the things that you have. And so I hope you just at least take that story to go, hey, this matters. And what you do athletically matters. And what you do when you're representing CHA out there matters. And it was tough. I'm going to be honest with you, it was tough for me. I witnessed to my friends a lot going through school. And I would witness to him about Christ. And I remember one of my most uh, best friends that I witnessed to the most about that was not a believer. I had a really hard time with him because of the representation of CHA during that. So what you do matters. And I hope you understand that because it does impact people's lives. And uh, it impacts people's ability to share the gospel. And so uh, I hope that's a challenge to you. I love Mr. Holmes. He's such a great man. I, uh, you guys always talk about mission trips with Mr. Holmes. I got an opportunity to go to Kenya with Mr. Holmes for a week. And I remember I roomed with Mr. Holmes. And the first day, Mr. Holmes, he opens up his luggage. And he looks at me and says, oh, my gosh. He said, I didn't pack any underwear. And I'm like, Mr. Holmes. And so you may have spent a week with Mr. Holmes on a mission trip. But you have never done what I did. I spent a week with Mr. Holmes on a mission trip. Commando. All right, come on now. Let's go. So anyway, there you go. I'm here today not to talk about all that. I'm here today to talk about adoption. And uh, we're going to start with two scriptures, and this is going to be the basis of uh, what I share with you today. First out of Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 21. I use this phrase a lot uh, in our home, but uh, do not lay up your, for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, I love to say that just many times when things are happening, just, just, I'll just out of the blue, it's go moth and rust. Like, that doesn't matter. None of that matters. And then James 1, 27, 
Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Hey, growing up, I was anti-mission, so I was raised in church my whole life. Uh, my wife Shelly's here with me today. Shelly's the pastor's daughter of Hereford Assembly of God. Uh, my mom was music minister there. We, we were raised in church. I loved church. I loved Jesus. I hated missions. Hated missions. I always said, why are we helping people there and we help people here? I never understood why we did that. Some of you are like, how could you be like that, man? I love missions. Well, you've experienced it. I had never experienced it. I didn't know. And I, uh, uh, Shelly and I were at a concert one time with the CHA family, and we, uh, we, we adopted a couple kids to, uh, water, through uh, Compassion International, right? And so we, like, you sponsor kids. You may have, you, your families may do this. And we sponsor kids through, through uh, Compassion. And so we, uh, when I say adopt them, I mean, like, like, bring them here, adoption. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But we sponsor kids through Compassion. Well, when Camden and Casey, football players, you know him as Coach Cargill. That's my oldest son, Camden. Um, when Camden and Casey were students here at CHA, they were 11 and 9, we we went to Kenya to meet our sponsor kid. I had never seen poverty. I didn't know what it was like, uh, is all I knew. We go to a village in Kenya, and they take us out into the bush. We drive about three hours out on four-by-fours in the middle of the Serengeti, and I'm telling you now, we were in the middle of nowhere land. There were no roads. We're just, it, it was unbelievable. We drive out into this village, and I'm telling you now, kids were sick. Now, when I tell you sick, like we go on home visits, every orifice was covered in flies, in the eyes, in the nose, in the ears, in the mouth, like flies. These kids were dying. And I'm overwhelmed. I've never seen it before. And some of you have never seen it either. But I'm going to tell you, I was overwhelmed. I'm like, I, I even remember I asked one of the compassion workers, I said, what is the death rate of these kids? And he told me, he said, we don't know. He said, but right here where we're standing, he said we would estimate about 40% would be dead by their fifth birthday. Now, they had told us before we went to that village that I needed to be careful with my girls. Casey, she was nine. Shelly, we're in this village, and in this village, they married girls at nine. In this village, women did not have value. If a war, warrior wanted a young lady, he claimed the girl. And they told me before we went to be careful with your girls. And they told me to keep them close, make sure you know where they're at. We get in this village, I'm overwhelmed with emotion, I'm seeing the sights, the smells, the heat, visualize it with me, the dirt, the kids, you're at the equator, I'm miserable, I'm sick, and I'm overwhelmed by all these emotions of my past and my beliefs about missions, and Shelly goes missing, no one can find her, and when I tell you no one, I mean no one, no one can find Shelly, I tried not to make a scene, but I'm panicked. And I'm walking around as fast as I can, trying not to make that scene, saying, where's Shelly? Has anyone seen Shelly? Where's Shelly? I can't find Shelly. Where's Shelly? And I remember saying to God, God, I came to this place trying to serve you, trying to understand missions, and it's the first time I've ever done this, and I've lost my wife. And finally, I got to one person, and he said, I thought I saw her go back to the four-by-fours. And I went as fast as I could back to the four-by-fours, and she wasn't there. And again, I'm just crying. And I'm saying, God, what have I done? And I walked around to the back side of that four by four, and there was Shelly sitting in the dirt of the Serengeti, sobbing. And I sat down with her. I didn't say anything, I just cried and held her. I don't know if it was a minute, two minutes, what it was, but I held her and we cried. And I will never forget it's the most impactful moment of my Christian life. She grabbed me by my collar. She pulled me nose to nose, and I mean just sobbing. And she said, no child should live like this. And she said, somebody's got to do something. I don't even know how you answer that. To the men in this room, you're going to have a big challenge in your life because you're going to want to be a solutionist. Every time you see a problem, you're going to want to fix it because that's what we do as men. And I'm going to tell you right now, men, you're not the solution. God is the solution. And when you make that understanding in your life, that you turn to God and ask, how? Help me, God. I want to be used. That's when you will find hope. That's when you'll find purpose. And that's what happened to me that day. I found purpose. And I said, I don't know how we fix this. But I said, I promise we'll do something. It's a big step for Christians. Do something. We ended up doing a big water of life project at that village, and then later we were like, okay, God, now what? And that's when Shelly and I decided that we should consider adoption. So 
through a, I'm going to jump ahead in the story a little bit. We decided to adopt from the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's one of the poorest places in the entire world. When I was in Congo, they took us through the slums of Kinshasa. I was going to orphanages, and I was doing some uh, work with water filters in the, in the slums. We're driving down these dirt roads. I felt like we went for hours. We didn't, but it felt like it. And we're driving on these dirt roads, and there's raw sewage canals on both sides and kids everywhere, and these kids are sick. And when I tell you sick now, it's, it took me back to Kenya, but it was worse. And I watched people drinking out of the raw sewage. I watched them bathing in the sewage. I watched kids digging through trash trying to find food to eat. And I told my government driver, I said, listen, I was in a village in Kenya where 40% of the kids are dead by their fifth birthday. And I said, but it wasn't this. What is it here? And again, he said, we don't know. He said, but right here, we estimate about 60% of our kids are dead by five. That is where Clarity and Creed grew up in Congo and Kinshasa. We got, we got in a mess in our adoption process with Clarity, Creed, Kai, Carly, Crosby. It was a mess. And uh, we got caught in an embezzlement scandal. It cost us everything. And I got to ask you a question. I've, I've, I've said this before to people. I've said, hey, listen, if you were about to make a decision that you knew would cost you everything, and when I say everything, like all your money, your home, everything you have, and even the one you love the most in your life, if you thought you would lose it all, and in the end, you would say it was worth it, would you be able to do that if it was for Christ? I think that's a big question. And what's crazy is maybe even say it was worth it and you would do it again, see? So, Shelly and I lose everything. And when I say everything, I mean, it's true. We lost, we lost our home. We, in, in one year, uh, the adults in here are going to get this for sure. You're going to go, what? Um, 2014, 15, 16, we spent an enormous amount of money on adoption. In 2015 alone, we spent over $100,000 in adoption fees. That's pretty incredible. And we go broke. We get to August of 2015, and Clarity and Creed are stuck in Congo in a home that we had purchased with a bunch of other families, waiting for their president to let them come home. They've been stuck for two years. We adopted Kai, Carly, and Crosby. You guys don't know Crosby. Crosby's our special needs kid. Kai and Carly's little brother. He goes to Choctaw schools. But we adopted them, and we get to August of 2015, and it's, it's, we get to the point that we have to make the final payment for them uh, to finalize our adoption so they could come home. Well, we owed $30,000 at the end of August. Now, that's a lot of money. Well, Shelly and I have been spending so much money, we were down to 10. We had 10,000 left. And we get to the end of the month, and we didn't have the money. And I remember Shelly and I were devastated because if we don't make this payment, Kai, Carly, and Crosby go back to the street. Now, you guys know Kai and Carly? And I want you to think about that. If they were not here today and they went back to the street, that's like what we're, oh my gosh. We, we didn't have the money, so we called the adoption agency, and we said, hey, we don't have it, and we said, um, can we get an extension? And they contact the Ugandan government, they give us a one-month extension. We get to September of 2015, and we are still at $10,000. We're spending so much money, we're not making any ground. Shelly's asking me over and over, are we going to be able to do it? Are we going to be able to pay it? And I'm like, I, I don't know. We've got to depend on God. Now, what you must understand is not a soul knew, no one. Shelly and I had made a decision. It was our decision to do this, and we're not going to make others help us pay this, and we're going to be fully dependent on God. That was our theme that year. Our parents didn't know. Camden and Casey didn't know. No one knew that we were at the very end and going to lose Kai, Carly, and Crosby, and we kept praying, God, you've got to come through. Now, those of you that have been to my ACT class, you guys sat here in this room, and we had our nice little group right up here, and um, students paid by the student to come to my class, and I, uh, we're $20,000 short, and we're five days from making this payment. I drove to Anson, Texas. It's a little bitty town in the middle of cotton fields north of Abilene, and it's a five-hour drive, and I drive for five hours through the night. I leave about three in the morning, and I drive for five hours, and I'm going to tell you, for five straight hours, I literally cried to God, literally. And I said, God, you know we didn't do this selfishly. You know we're just trying to serve you. That's it. And I said, God, we are about to fail there's three kids getting ready to go back to the street, and God, you got to come through, and you got to come through big. I walked into that auditorium. They told me to go to the auditorium. I go to the auditorium, and I start setting up my projector, getting ready to start. And as I'm setting up, I notice this front left section over here starts filling. And when I say filling, I'm not talking like a few seats. I'm talking like every seat. 
like literally kids start filling. They pay by the student now, start filling every seat. And I remember I was crying, man, already. And I'm like, God, what are you doing? And pretty soon the counselor rushes down to me and she says, Chad, do you have more stuff? And I said, I brought everything I got. And she said, go to your car, get everything you have. She said, we have busloads pulling in. I said, busloads? I had been doing the workshop 24 years at that time, and the largest group I had ever had was 310 students at a class, and it was because they ran like a 70% discount on my class, okay? That's the only reason. And uh, so there's three, that's the most I'd ever had in 24 years. And the whole, I go out to the car in the middle of West Texas, little cotton field. I've been going to this school for years. I'm, this school's smaller than CHA. Bus after bus after bus after bus starts pulling in to that school's parking lot. 32 school buses pulled in that morning. I walked back into that auditorium. The whole thing was full. And when I say the whole thing, I'm talking every seat. It's time to start. I can't start. I'm crying. Counselor walks down to me. Principal, superintendent. I said, I got to tell you my testimony. I said, we're $20,000 short. I said, my kids are going back to the street, man. We've been trying to adopt for years. I said, we can't pay it. And I said, look at this. And the counselor she looked at me and she said, Chad, there's 642 paid kids here at this workshop. She said, we'll mail you a check tomorrow. They mailed me a $19,000 check. We made that payment. Listen, what I have found, and I hope you find this too, when you put yourself where you are totally dependent on God, that's when he'll reveal himself. We're, we're so much about being solutionists, trying to do it on our own. You guys know that you have a problem. You just go try to fix it. I'm telling you right now, you can't fix it, man. There's going to be times in life with your marriage, your home, your job, you can't fix it. And you've got to make a decision. Do you want to be totally dependent on God? And I'm going to tell you, that is the best place you will ever be. When you are broken, when you are dependent on God, he'll reveal himself. That's when he'll reveal himself. He goes, God, real, you'll find him, but you've got to be willing to sacrifice all. The stuff of this life, it's moth and rust, man. It's moth and rust. I'm going to tell you one more quick story on that, and then I'll tell you about our last adoption. Um, Shelly gets really sick in Uganda when she goes to bring the kids home, January of 2016. She gets really sick. She gets malaria, and then she gets some sickness. They don't even know what it was. And, and uh, Shelly, uh, uh, she's got to come home. I mean, she's so sick that the U.S. Embassy rejects the adoption. Uh, it's, it's a crazy story, but um, they tell her she's got to stay maybe up to a year and wait on the kids to come home. And I tell her, hey, you're so sick, you got to come home. And I remember we were so broke. We, had, you know, we didn't have any money. We were so broke. I remember she's on the phone crying to me, and she says, Chad, you know we can't afford it. You know we can't afford for me to come home. I've got to stay until I can bring the kids home because we didn't have the money. We, we literally did not have the money. And, uh, and I knew she was right. But... I want you to know something, that there were some CHA families who perceived we were struggling, and what we didn't know is they had gone to other CHA families, they said, hey, we think the Cargills are in trouble, we think they need some help, and would you really want to give some money to help the Cargills with their adoption? And uh, I said, Shelly, there's a check on our fridge right now for $1,850, it showed up today. And I said, we can pay for you to come home. What we didn't know is that the Newthmans, the Rankins, the Vernons, the Best, the Corps, the Pinwells, Faith and Ash, others had given. And Shelly says, okay, I'll come home. We fly her home. Two days later, she's in the hospital. Two days later, she's about to die. And I was in the hospital room. I was holding Shelly. And I knew she was about to die. The infectious disease doctor had just told me. He said, I don't, I don't know if she's going to. I don't think. But he said, I don't know. And I was holding her, and she was about to die. And I remember I asked God this simple question. I said, God, how am I going to tell our kids that you're good if their mom died adopting them? And I did not know how I was going to answer that. Shortly after that, Shelly turned, stared at the ceiling, and it was over. And I remember I, I said to God a simple statement. I said, okay, God, okay, God, because I've made a decision he was good. Well, they revived her. Obviously, she's here today. Five minutes later, the code blue team comes. They, they, through a five-minute process, they revived her, and uh, she survived. Three months later, the, the kids come home. Our, our family goes from two kids to seven kids instantly. 
They spoke no English, two different languages. I don't know what you think that might be like, but I'm going to tell you it was insane craziness. Uh, the first meal Shelly made, she made a bowl of white rice with a baked chicken leg on top, set it out for the kids. They didn't go for the utensils. They didn't know utensils, right? Dove in with their hands. Rice is going everywhere. We're like, oh my gosh, we've got to get them outside. We corral them up. We get them to take it outside. They brought back empty bowls. If anyone ever tells you you'll choke on the chicken bone, it's not true. I have five to prove it. All right? The whole thing disappeared. It was legit. The second day we had corn on the cobs, our meal, my kids ate the cobs. I didn't even know you could do that. They ate them. All right? I remember once they learned English, we had corn on the cob, and Creed looked at us. He goes, Daddy, do you remember the day you gave us corn on the cob? And I'm like, yes. And I said, you ate it? He goes, I know. He said, I couldn't believe you gave all of us corn on the cob. He's like, we had never had corn on the cob before. They were scavengers, right? They what people threw away. We're so blessed. Fourth of July, they thought a war broke out. It was terrible. They kept feeling, soldiers die. Right? They kept diving for cover. We're like, no. And Clarity looked at me. She goes, why is the boom good? <laughs> I don't know. In America, we love the boom. All right? First winter, they're from the equator. They had no idea why the air got cold, right? And so we're at the Vernon's house, and we, uh, we, we go to our car that night, and all of a sudden, Clarity starts screaming, fire, fire, and starts wailing, crying. And I mean, everybody's freaking out. They thought, I mean, I thought the house was burning down. And finally, I grab that woman. I'm like, calm down. Where's the fire? And she goes, in me, fire. And I go, what are you talking about? And she goes, daddy, watch. <sighs> she had never seen her breath before. When we were in Congo, Clarity would have nothing to do with me. She hated me. Like, really, she hated me. Um, and that's what I thought anyway. She wouldn't have anything to do with me. And, uh, like, for real, like, she, she didn't want to be around me. And, like, like, they had a swimming pool there, and we go swimming in the pool. And she wouldn't even, like, uh, but this other dad in there, she loved him. She'd be around him all the time. But, uh, so Shelly and I talked about that for, you know, two years. Like, we got to be patient with her. It's going to take her a while before she's going to, you know. And uh, so anyway, the day they come home to America... We see them down the terminal, and uh, we kind of lower down, and they come running down that terminal to us. It's been two and a half years we waited for them, and uh, we squat down, and when they got just right out about three, four rows in, Clarity took a beeline straight to me and just dove on me, and uh, I just cried. It, it really is one of the best memories ever, and uh, once she learned English, she was, a, she was at home, and she said, she said, Mommy, she said, you know in Congo, me scared of Daddy, all right? And Shelly goes, yes, we were worried about that, and why? And she goes... He have hair. And she said, hair on his arms, hair on his chest, hair on his legs. He have hair. And I'm like, well, why didn't she? Why about that other dad? Well, no, he shaved everything. All right? So he was bald. So anyway, she was scared of men with hair. So there you go. That's that. Now, I want to share with you a, a final little story here. Um, and that is the story. If we can, John, if you're up there, we can put on that second picture. The, the first one of the family, uh, this is just all the kids. If you want to just throw that up there real quickly. And then uh, uh, if you want to put that second picture up there, if, if you got it, it's great. But uh, Shelly and I decided to adopt one more. Now, this story's going to get a little weird, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, I'm gonna try to do it here in the last few minutes, if, if that's all right. I might, might, a couple minutes might go over. I'm going to try not to. Okay. So Shelly and I decided to adopt one more. And I want to I want to show you my baby girl. If you shall, I just have her stand up. Just that way we do this quick. Just stand up. It's my baby girl. Just kind of hold her up there. It's my baby girl, Cat Liberty. Say hi, Cat. Say hi, everybody. No to the kids. Say hi. My baby girl, Cat Liberty. Now we recently had Cat's fourth birthday party, and for Cat's fourth birthday, Shelly made her two cakes. We had a cake set happy birthday with four. And we had a Kirk cake said happy Earth Day with eight. Why? Because the day Cat was born, she was four. I have your attention. Good. Cat's biological mom and dad immigrated to the United States from India about 20 years ago. They came as college students, we believe. Many years later, they did it in vitro. They took 10 eggs from Cat's biological mom, fertilized those 10. Cat's biological mom and dad had 10 kids in the embryo stage. They used five of them to build their family and had two kids and said, we're done. That's all the kids we would like to have. The problem was they had five more kids in the embryo stage. What happened to them? They're frozen. They put them into a cryogenic chamber. They're cryogenically frozen. They stay there in that perfect little healthy state as long as their mom and dad pay their monthly storage fees to keep them there. There are over one million frozen children in the United States right now. And more are being added every day. And some have been frozen since the 1980s. Their parents are in their 60s, still paying storage fees to keep their kids frozen. Shelly and I have talked about this for years, and we've said, listen, if we really believe what we say about life, maybe we should do something. 
So we drove to the National Embryo Donation Center in Knoxville, Tennessee. They did tests on Shelly, and they figured out at age 45, she was still healthy, able to carry and deliver. And so we adopted three of those five frozen embryos Kat's biological parents had. They put three into Shelly, and two did not survive, but one did. And four years ago, at the age of 46, Shelly delivered our eighth child, Cat Liberty. The doctor was holding the bloody newborn. At the moment of birth, like, just trying to be funny, I leaned forward and I go, is this the first time you've delivered a four-year-old? And she looked at me, she goes, what? I said, never mind, keep working. And the next day, the nurse came in, because we never explained it. And the nurse came in and goes, what did he mean, four-year-old newborn? And Shelly goes, well, Kat had been frozen for three years. And again, just being funny, I go, she was just chilling. And so she spent three years frozen, one year in Shelly, and the day Kat was born, she was four. So we celebrate her birthday and her Earth Day, because she'd been alive on the Earth for eight years. So we celebrate both, and we do that every year, and we talk about it with them every year. Kat still has two siblings that are frozen. They're still waiting. That troubles us. It's hard for us. It's hard for us to talk about. Her siblings are still frozen and waiting. And uh, I'm going to read to you something. I've never done this before, and one of the reasons why I've never have done this, because I always break down when I do it. This is a hard one, but uh, I've spoken many times to many groups, many churches, I've never shared this, and uh, I'm going to do it with you today because uh, CHA is special to me, and I, I want to read it to you. So this is something that I, I wrote the kid's story. I've got the whole story written, and this is the, way, this is the very, last, uh, very last part of the book. This is a letter from Kat to Shelley. Kat is Cat Liberty. Liberty means to deliver from confinement, to release from this constraint. It was cold in there. I waited with my friends and my siblings for so many dark days and nights. Sometimes a bright light shone from above us. Those were days my friends disappeared. We celebrated for them. They made it to the light. Although some of my friends still looked like me, they had been there waiting 30 years, I had only been there three. We cheered the hardest for them, and we were sad each time they didn't see the light. Years of waiting, we wondered why some were taken and others had to stay. Maybe someday my time would come, and I could see what shone so brightly on the other side. I remember a special day the light above us appeared, only this time, I started moving to the light. My brothers and sisters were next to me. We silently screamed, pick me, pick me. We squeezed together, each of us only a few cells surrounded by our own walls. Suddenly, I was launched into a tube. I saw the light. I looked for my brothers, sisters, and my friends, but I only found two of my siblings. I realized my other two siblings didn't get to see the light. One day I felt a warmth I could not understand, and suddenly my cells started splitting, and I began to grow. Then my siblings and I were on a wild ride through warm fluid, trying to grab hold before we were washed away. My brothers pushed me forward. I heard them shout, go, we'll help you make it. All three of us got so close. I pressed against the soft red, soft red wall and grabbed on. My brothers were next to me. Keep trying, I shouted. Keep trying. But soon one and the other disappeared from my side. I never saw them again. I swam around in that warm fluid for days and days. I did flips and twists. I had so much fun. Sometimes I bounced around and played. I had sat still in the cold for so long, I hoped I would never have to go back. Then, one day, I had grown so much, and I was so cramped in that space, I decided I had enough. I was going to find that light again. And that is the day I saw you, Mom. You held me on your warm chest. I heard you whispering and singing. I remember I cried. Now I know who you are. I've started to understand what you say. I'm so happy. I'm free now to grow and be anything I want to be. I'm Cat Liberty, and you are my mom. 
I miss my brothers who are lost inside you. And I miss my two siblings who are still in the cold. And I hope someday they too will find a warmth like I found with you. Look, I don't think everyone should adopt. I don't. I think that's a tough, that's a tough decision. It's got to be something. If you ever choose to adopt, I, I hope that you really feel God calling both of you to do it. And I hope that you, um, you're in agreement in your marriage. But I'm going to give you a challenge. This may be a little bit big for some of you to understand, but this is what I really hope is a, is a reasonable challenge. Some of us in this room will do what's called in vitro. You'll learn about that later. You can talk to your parents about that tonight if you'd like. Some of you will do it. Shine, I almost did that. And, and here's what my prayer is that I hope that if you do, that you'll pray about it and all of the little frozen or little embryos that you create, I hope you give them a chance to see the light. Now, I, it's a big discussion and one I think you should have with your parents someday, okay? And talk about that with you and your spouse. And then I also hope that as you grow, you pray about this and if God starts tugging you toward adoption, toward seeing little faces like this and saying, God, I want to be that. I want to go to those that are the least of these. I want to go to those, and I, I want to value those things that have eternal uh, uh, value. And, and you do that, I, I hope you'll consider some of those one million children that are waiting, all right? I'm not saying that's right for everybody, but I hope that you might consider that someday as well. And uh, look, I know you hear a lot of chapel speeches, and you're not going to remember much from this, but I, I, I do hope that impacts you just a little bit today. And it's something maybe someday that you'll consider and at least start that discussion uh, with others. So uh, Moth and Russ, man, Moth and Russ, be thinking about that, all right? So anyway, hey, uh, Troop, thanks for letting me come out today, man. I appreciate you. Troop's just been such a great friend. Mr. Bullard, uh, Josh, thank you for letting me come out. And all the, you guys, you're awesome. And uh, if you see us around, say hey, all right? Don't act like you don't know us. Thanks, sir. Appreciate you. Thanks. There's, there's a few people that you'll... You'll develop friends in your life, and hopefully one day you'll have a friend, how like a Chad. Honestly, um, I, I don't know that I've ever been around Chad that I walk away and I'm not a better person. I've been around a lot of people, and I walk away and I'm the same. Sometimes I'm worse because of what they've said, um, but I don't ever remember that about Chad. Here's the next thing I want you to remember. I want you to remember, you'll remember his stories, but I want you to look to your left, I want you to look to your right, and just who's sitting beside you, then look who's in front of you, look behind you, okay, everybody in here is equally valuable, and none of you are any better than one of those kids that is still living in, living in the Congo, whose face is full of flies, whose stomach is bloated, and they won't make it to their fifth birthday. None of us are better there or more valuable than that person. Yeah. And you need to remember that. I need to remember that because how we treat each other tells us, tells me how I treat Chad. And Chad has a hard time walking. And there's other people who have other disabilities. I wear hearing aids because God gave me bad ears. And there's people who have disfigured faces, and we treat them differently. There's people who have a different skin color or whatever. And if I treat them any different than I treat the person who looks normal on the outside, what I am saying is I am more valuable than you. And that's a lie. We are all equally valuable. And really, my heart for CHA is that whoever comes here, regardless of how you look, regardless of how smart you are, regardless of how good of an athlete, any of that, it doesn't matter. You are treated like everybody else. And Chad lives that. And you have the opportunity, by God's grace, to live that. And the last thought is, Mr. Holmes always said it, if you want to live an amazing life, trust God. 
And one day, maybe you will stand up and have, it won't be the same story, but you will have a story of what God did in and through you. And it'll be way bigger than you could ever imagine. I don't know what it'll be, but you will have a story that will impact people. And hopefully you'll be an individual that when people are around you, they walk away and say, you know what? I love being around her. I love being around him because they make me better. Make people better by valuing people. Let me pray. God, we love you. Nothing that we are makes us worthy of love. And yet you chose to love us. And just like Chad chose chose the kids from Africa because they're valuable. And God, I just pray, Lord, that you would teach us we are all valuable. Nobody is worthy. Nobody deserves to be degraded, looked down on, made fun of for whatever reason. We deserve to be valued because we're created in your image. So I thank you for the lessons that we have the opportunity to learn. I pray that we would learn them. And we'll know that we learn them by how we live. And so I pray that you would um, go before us. And I thank you for your love. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, before we dismiss, remember you're going to get a baby bottle. And here's the cool thing about it. The way God works, you don't know my $2 a change or whatever it may save a life and that life may end up going to heaven sometime at some point and maybe you meet them because you gave your change. Maybe you don't have coffee or something for two weeks, two and a half weeks we're doing this and you just saved that money. Um, anyway, so I encourage you to do it. Um, encourage you to participate. Freshman, sophomore, if you'll go out the back, and you'll get the baby bottle on the way out, and then there's a few. So junior high girls, I think there's some over here for you to get, and then the rest of us will head out here. If they, end up, if they run out at a door, go to a different door and grab a baby bottle, and don't leave them in your locker. Okay, Take them home, start filling them up, tell your parents about it, and then we'll be telling you what to do with them as we get closer to the end of that. You are dismissed. Thank you.